like he was before. Now I'm an entrepreneur. That is a business to me. Welcome to this edition of Backstage Pass with Leah Chang. I'm your host, Leah Chang. Today, I'm at the Manetta Lane Theater, where Dead Outlaw is currently playing and has been extended due to popular demand until April 14th. I'm sitting down with one of my favorite collaborators on the planet, Tom Sesma, who is a veteran of seven Broadway shows and is featured as Dr. Thomas Noguchi in Dead Outlaw. Here I am. Welcome to the show, Tom. Hi, thanks for having me. I'd like to know what it's like to be working with the award-winning collaborators of the band's visit on this new musical, Dead Outlaw. Um, really, really exciting. Lots of fun. Terrifying. It was an amazing process. Uh, you know, David Cromer, Itamar Moses, and David Yazbek are, um, I think I said this in another interview that I had with you not too long ago, um, they view the theatrical world through an entirely original lens. And um, it's challenging to go in there with um, all of us, with, uh, you know, uh, an aggregate of a century of theatrical experience mm. um, between all of us. and. Um, be asked to do things that are just counterintuitive, things that you've never done before, things that you never dreamed of doing or learned not to do in all of the training and in all of the rehearsals and in all of the shows that you've ever done because that's what's always been done. But these guys are making something and have made something, I think, that's wholly original completely crazy and oddball. But, <laughs> and I loved it. I but, loved every minute of it. <laughs> but really, really original and inventive and truthful, incredibly truthful. Um, I think theater artists pay a lot of lip service to being present all the time mm -hmm. and to telling the truth, to being completely honest. Uh, and then we contrive ways of creating something that looks like truth but as I learned in this process, um, is really sort of truth through a filter. Um, there is no filters here. We are just telling a story. We are just telling a story and uh, letting the audience put it together, letting the audience in here as collaborators with us. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. So who do you play? I play Dr. Thomas Noguchi, at, uh, for those of you who um, remember. Uh, or might well, have heard of him. The, Virginia, uh, our dear friend Virginia Wing that I brought said she was in LA at the time that this case was happening. So she was very wow. familiar with Thomas Noguchi. Well, Noguchi was there for, Noguchi was the uh, uh, chief coroner of the LA County Coroner's Office for a very, very long time. And uh, he was famous, some might say notorious, for working on high profile slash celebrity cases mm. going back to Marilyn Monroe, okay. uh, through Sharon ah, Tate, that's why uh, Robert names. F. Kennedy, oh. Natalie Wood, um, and some might call him controversial okay. uh, and justifiably. Um, some might even call him divisive, mm. but um, he's a fascinating, fascinating character and a fascinating case study himself. Mm. So. Um, it's exciting to play him. Um, like all of the characters in this play, Noguchi is on the periphery of the story, yet he's deeply involved in the journey of Elmer McCurdy mm -hmm. as an outlaw and as a mummy. I'm going to leave it Crazy. at that. Mystery. Because, yes, actually, we, it is, we're going to keep it we're going to keep the dead outlaw mystery and reveals very much under wrap because you just need to come and experience it. I want to tell you the true story of the dead outlaw, Elmer McCurdy. All right, boys, let's go rob that train. Your mama's dead, your daddy's dead, your brother's dead, and so are you. Hey. 
I mean, right now you're in a in a marvelous show mm -hmm. that is um, dead outlaw. That is actually Audible's first commission musical, and you're actually in the recording studio. Can we talk about that? Yeah, we're we're spending this week recording the. I I guess you'd call it the audiobook version of Dead Outlaw. We're recording the entire show. I don't know when it will be released, but it's it's very, very cool. It's not the same thing as recording a cast album, which mm -hmm. I've done before. Um, cast albums tend to be thrown together beautifully uh, within a day or two, um, but we are recording from beginning to end every single word of dialogue. Wow. Uh, and what's really interesting is that we don't have to make adaptations to it because um, one of the conceits of Dead Outlaw is that it's a narrative musical. It's a narrative tale. Um, it's told by the band leader. Right. Um, and I don't want to say that it was expressly written for Audible in that sense, but it fits Audible's profile very, very well. The writing in the show is is incredible because it's it's so smart, it's so economical, it's so spare. But every single one of these actors, and I'm going to name them because they're so incredible. Jeb Brown plays the band band leader. Then there's da the, the the amazing Andrew Durand as Elmer McCurdy, our dead outlaw, gives a performance that you will never ever ever forget. Sure. Um, uh, Julia Nitel. Dashiell Eves, Eddie Cooper, uh, the fabulous Tom Sussma. Who is he? <laughs> yeah. Who is he? Right. Uh, who have I forgotten? I know uh, uh, Trent Sanders and Ken Marks. Yeah. Um, genius actors. I have so many favorite moments in the show every single night, and not a single one of them is mine because I enjoy watching each of these people so much. And everybody has a standout moment. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the incredible thing. Everybody has a standout moment, not just as, um, not just as actors, but as characters. Mm -hmm. And each one of these characters is memorable. They're sad, they're funny. But they're, and they're all true. This entire story is true. And everything that happens that you see in the oh, 90 plus minutes that this show takes place actually happened at some point in time. Maybe not singing and dancing, but it did happen. And um, I also uh, want to point out Max Sangerman, um, George Merrick, uh, Emily Fink, and Austin who are incredible standbys who are doing uh, gangbuster work every single day. And let's talk about the band. Spencer Cohen, that's right, Eric De La Pena, uh, Rebecca Bruce, um, Chris Smiley. Chris Smiley and Hank yes. Hammond. I had the opportunity to see you star as Sweeney Todd. <laughs> you know, I've seen you do a lot of things star in times there are changing. Oh my gosh, the very first professional job I ever had. It's kind of out of that groove. I think it was probably playing Bob Cratchit in... Um, Actually, that wasn't, that, you would call it semi-professional uh, because it wasn't well, a professional theater yet. San Diego Repertory Theater did a production of A Christmas Carol way back when. Um, and That's uh, what I was saying about falling into this groove. I mean, I've played all of these like really angry sort of bad guys, bad guys. Sweeney Todd, the engineer in Miss Saigon, Scar in The Lion King, Scrooge in uh, some version or other uh, or variation on A Christmas Carol. Um, and um, any number of characters like that in plays that you or musicals that you might not ha have heard of. Um, and I like to say, same villain, different dress. <laughs> it's just kind <laughs> of what I do. And different century. But every now and then I've also uh, had the opportunity to play a, a few nice guys or a few um, unfortunate victims of these people, like Bob Cratchit. Um, but that's that's. Yeah, I guess that's kind of what I do. Well, you've also been hitting a lot of the classics, mm -hmm. classics in the canon. You most recently did Oliver at New York City Center <laughs> as part of their Encore series. Interestingly enough, I played an undertaker in Oliver, and uh, I'm playing a coroner in Dead Outlaw. Mm, so. Typecasting, maybe? Maybe. Same and, villain, different dress. And you've also been working on a lot of new works. <clears throat> most recently, you were in Double Helix. 
Double Helix, yes. Uh, a at new Bay musical Street at Theater. Bay Street Theater. A uh, new musical, gorgeous new musical about um, Rosalind Franklin, the woman who is elemental in the discovery of DNA and who for any number of uh, very controversial reasons was shut out of the Nobel Prize, mm. um, primarily because she was a woman and right. a Jew. And then just coming back from the pandemic, Letters from Suresh, Rajiv Joseph, for second stage. Yes, not a villain. In not a, a villain. Um, that was an extraordinary experience, too. Uh, I got to work with one of my favorite directors, Maya Dralis, and um, I'm a huge fan and was a huge fan of Rajiv's work. Uh, and again, to do a play that has a very, very different, that views the world again through a very, very different lens was exciting. Um, it's not the current kind of storytelling that you're used to mm -hmm. um, in, in a play or a musical. Um, it was a play that was told entirely through letters. Uh, and I played a character who all those letters are about and who really doesn't appear until the end of the play. And um, whether he lives up to uh, the image that the letter writers created is, I think, one of the mysteries, one of the beautiful mysteries about that play. What was it like, uh, because I believe that was the first show that you did coming back from the pandemic, so I know that there were a lot of, you know, under very tight restrictions coming back in terms of working in the theater and um, navigating it was, everyone staying healthy as possible? It was difficult. There were, there were uh, protocols in the theater that we really maintained, very strict protocols about masking, about social distancing, about how to work together, about how to maximize our ability to work together within the restrictions that we had. Um, once the play opened, uh, there were protocols for the audience as well. Mind you, we were just coming back, and it was one of the first plays to open again. Um, so our audiences were spare. People were, uh, people were really timid about coming back. But they came back, they wore masks, um, they really connected with this play that was about a kind of social distancing. Mm -hmm. It was about people being unable to connect. Sure. Um, and dealing with that idea of not being able to connect in their letters to each other. Right. Uh, it, was, it was really, really uh, kind of extraordinary. Um, Doing it was special. Doing it for an audience, doing it for that first audience was extraordinary because we had just gone through a couple of years of no audiences, not just no audiences, but really uh, not being in a room filled with people. Then all of a sudden we were in a room filled with people. But I have to say it pales in comparison to the audition for that ah. because um, it was my first live and in-person audition okay. since the shutdown. I walked into a room, Rajiv was there, May was there, uh, the casting director, Karen Castle was there, um, the reader was there, and uh, somebody else from the casting office who was taping the, uh, taping the audition. And I took my mask off. And it was the first time I had taken my mask off in a public place in front of people in quite a while. Mm. And, um, I really got emotional. I, I don't think I'm misremembering. I got a little choked up. I got mm. a little teary mm -hmm. uh, because it represented a real monumental moment. Uh, this observation that somehow, for me, in that moment, the pandemic had ended. Right. The before times were before, and this was something present and new. Um, and of course, when it was over, I immediately put the mask back on. <laughs> but all of us, I, I think all of us in the room shared that moment mm. together. So you went from letters of Suresh yes. to playing Scrooge in a very different, well, the mashup, a Sherlock Carol. What was that like? Oh, it was so much fun. It was ridiculous. It was a ridiculous amount of fun. Um, I was in a room. Uh, led by Mark Shanahan, a uh, very, very wonderful director 
inventive and clever and funny as all get out, uh, who wrote the adaptation. It's so funny, to, to call it a mashup isn't, doesn't do the piece justice. It is a really, really interesting and well-made play. It's a very inventive, right. well-made play. Right, uh, you know, a, um, I'm not gonna say it was a Sherlock Holmes version of A Christmas Carol, uh, or a, um, or a Dickensian version of Sherlock Holmes. It was a beautiful blending of these two to create an entirely original, mysterious narrative mm. that had a very satisfying, mm -hmm. uh, happy Christmas ending. And, and you, I you, played Scrooge in that. And you were in a room full of some serious clowns. Serious clowns. Um, Versatile serious Drew clowns. Drew McVitie was a brilliant Sherlock Holmes. Um, but, um, yeah, Mark Price, Dan Dominguez, I I Isabel Keen Keating, and uh, Anissa Felix. Uh, we, we were a crazy, crazy team of people who uh, created Dickensian in London. Um, they were, every, every day in that room was a master class watching uh, Anissa and Dan and Isabel and uh, Mark, who at the drop of a hat would change character, not just um, sort of Saturday Night Live uh, funny characters, mm -hmm. but, but three-dimensional beings with a history and with a future right. that you were actually engaged with. Um, for the time that we're on stage. You wanted to see more of them every time. It's true. Yeah. It's true. I've seen the show several times and uh, enjoyed it every single time. It's no surprise. I even saw it in London. Did you? Yes. I went to London because a friend of mine was the music director for Mandela and it was the first time that it was playing there. So I actually made the trek and it was really cool because the um, the tube station was the Baker Street station, and they went to the Sherlock Museum. So and you've also been working a great deal with classic stage companies in many classics. Can you tell me your top three of the ones that you've worked on and the, the incredible casts that you've been working with? I think I did three. So it would be easy oh. to, e it would be <laughs> easy to in, mention my well, top let's three. Let's do it in the order that you Pacific like them the Overtures, best. Pacific uh, Overtures which is a very, very important play for me personally. Um, Tell him what I see. I am in a tree, I am ten. I am in a tree. I was younger then. Between the eaves I can see. Tell me what I see. I was only ten. Resistible Rise of Arturo Ui um, with Raul Esparza uh, and the amazing, wonderful Eddie Cooper, who was also in Dead Outlaw. And um, last year I did A Man of No Importance, which the three of those together represent um, various high points in my career in my personal life, in my development as, uh, as an actor, as a creative artist, and as, and like I said, as a person. Well, for Pacific Overtures, you were nominated for a Lucille Lortel Award. I was. So, I was. was noticed. Yes, yes. And I just want to throw out, since you brought it up, not that I'm bragging, but uh, it's, a oh, brag it's, away. it's a credit to the play <laughs> itself. I was also nominated for a Lortel Award for Letters of Suresh. I know. And, um, you know, I, having this conversation just m m makes me want to say how extraordinarily lucky uh, 
blessed I have been blessed. in the last few years. Uh, I like to say that I don't know how that happened. I don't know why it happens, uh, but it's it's happened for me, and I, you know, I go to bed and I wake up grateful every single day about um, about how things have turned out. It's weird. I was thinking recently that I actually have the career right now that I always wanted when I started out as an actor. You know, I, I never anticipated that I would be a star or famous or, you know. Um, I just wanted to be a journeyman actor. Mm -hmm. You know, in the, in, in the, when the credits roll in a film and you see sure. the, the end of the credits, you see somebody's name and you know that that person worked hard to get there. Sure. And it isn't that I never felt that I deserved more, it's just that that's what I wanted. I just wanted to be a journeyman actor known as someone who, who works hard and who's grateful for his work. And it's so strange that um, I woke up one day and realized that I have that. Oh, great, I'm that guy at the end of the credits. <laughs> <laughs> I got an offer, so it was a great Thanksgiving that year. Um, and that was to do the sit-down production in Las Vegas, uh, which is pretty thrilling. Um, it was a beautiful, beautiful production. Um, and you were so good in it. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I was particularly proud of, of being in that production because it was an extraordinary group of people, some of whom had done Lion King before, most of whom who had not, most mm. of whom uh, just woke up every day with such a sense of gratitude and passion for what they were doing. We created a beautiful production. They sort of workshopped the production. They made some changes in it, in that production that they subsequently put into all the other productions around the world. So I was proud of that as well. Uh, and uh, we ran for three beautiful years at the uh, Mandalay Bay Theater. It's quite a run. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I wish it could have gone on forever, but it didn't. Uh, I'm glad it didn't only in the sense that there's a good possibility that I might still be doing it because I was having such a good time. Um, well, but now, do, do you know possibly how many other Asian American actors might have played the role? Or were you the first in the United States? There was one other Asian American actor who played Scar before me. His name was Kevin Gray. He, is, uh, uh, he has passed away uh, much too early, a great loss to our community. Uh, not just the Asian American community, uh, but uh, the Broadway community at large. He was a wonderful, wonderful man, wonderful actor. Uh, and from what I understand, I never saw him. I, I hear he was a really wonderful Scar mm. as well. Uh, Kevin and I were friends when we both started out in the 1980s, and we were the two young leading men, uh, who Asian American leading men who did musicals. Uh, and uh, one or the other would always- uh, Get the part. Get a part, and the other would subsequently play that part. Um, and then Kevin started doing um, uh, primarily uh, big Broadway musicals, and mm. I started doing sort of dark downtown plays <laughs> and television and film and things like that. And I, I think we both, I, I think uh, we were both really happy with how things turned out, but um, never stopped admiring each other's careers uh, with uh, a little bit of pride that comes mm. from familiarity and a little bit of jealousy, which mm -hmm. comes from familiarity. I was a big, can big, big fan of his. Many um, people are. Yeah. Not were. Yeah. Are. Um, and uh, I was very, very lucky to know him. What does it mean for you to be an Asian American theater maker in this time? Nothing has made me more proud than the fact that I've been able to work as an Asian American actor um, over the last few years doing both roles. Uh, that are specific to my own background and roles that are not um, in musicals and plays and podcasts and and what have you. Um, it's an extraordinary time to be making theater as a person of color right now. 
uh, that doesn't mean it's easy. That doesn't mean the challenges are not as great as they were when I was a young man. Um, they're different. Uh, they're hard in different ways, but they're just as hard. Um, but the struggles that we have to undertake to overcome those obstacles are the very things that make us different actors. We still have to be the best people in the room. Um, oh no, we have to be better than the best. And yeah. Twice, we, uh, right. twice as much to get right. half. Right, we do. It doesn't mean that we have to be satisfied with that. It just means that we have to acknowledge that's where we are and we have to keep fighting. Right. We have to keep moving forward. Why do you think people should come see Dead Outlaw? Oh my God, because it is funny and entertaining. The, the score is off the hook. The performances are like nothing you've ever seen. But mostly, I think it's time for people to come see something really original mm. and really just so completely unexpected, not just the story itself, but the way that the story is told. Mm -hmm. Everyone who has come to, come to see this so far has told me I did not know <laughs> what to expect. <laughs> and after the first five minutes, I was just along for the ride. Yeah. And I think that that's what's supposed to happen in the theater. Right. I think a lot of us, again, I, I use that term lip service a lot. A lot of us pay lip service to that idea when you go see a show. but. Honestly, this is the first time in my entire career where I've ever felt that that was really, really true. Well, especially too because everything that's been coming, right, almost boys. everything that's been coming to let's Broadway has been some jukebox musical or a musical made after a movie or anything like that. And instead, this is David Yazbek's obsession for 30 years <laughs> yes. and something that his, he and his friends slash colleagues have been developing in concerts at 54 Below and such mm -hmm. into this extraordinary piece of musical theater and story that's true. New block of tickets went on sale today. <laughs> you won't regret it. You won't forget it. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me for this edition of Backstage Pass with Leah Chang. Until next time.